What's up everybody? Welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we are going to be wrapping up book nine of the Iliad with the appeals of Phoenix and Ajax and the response of Achilles. Important to continue to think about what are the aspects of persuasion or what are the strategies of persuasion that these different uh, embassy members are going to be using to convince or in other words, to conquer Achilles, the great warrior, and get him back on their side. Think closely about the strategies that each are going to use. We're going to introduce a new key term as we move forward um, that is going to be introduced through Phoenix's story, and then we'll have Ajax's story as well. We're going to go ahead and pick up right around line 522. Achilles, when last we left off, was absolutely slamming Agamemnon's offer. And one thing to think about is why was he doing that? What does Achilles want? Remember when we went over the previous vocabulary words, apuena is the ransom, and that's something that's given that maintains the status quo. Think about why Achilles wouldn't want to do that. In addition, think about how the other uh, embassy members are going to change their strategies up based on what they know about what Achilles is actually going to want. And so start to make some predictions about what you think would work. So again, remember to suspend yourself, try to get in to the ancient Greek mindset. Don't think, oh man, if I was him, I would have gone in for all that gold. Now he's just a fool. Try to suspend that for a while, even if that is the thing that's right at the front of your mind. Save it and then see how... Um, Phoenix and Ajax might tr choose to continue to employ something like that or if they, if they switch it up a little bit. So right at around line 522, Achilles is going to stop and our man Phoenix is going to start. Just a little backstory um, very quickly on Phoenix just as a quick reminder. Phoenix was the man who helped raise Achilles as kind of like a secondary father, like a tutor and a teacher. And so he's extremely respected by Achilles. Keep that in mind as he's making his appeal. He stopped. This is Achilles. A stunned silence sees them all. Struck dumb. Achilles' ringing denials overwhelmed them so. At last, Phoenix, the old charioteer, spoke out. He burst into tears. Terror terrified for Achaea's fleet. Sail home? Is that what you're turning over in your mind, my glorious one, Achilles? Have you no heart at all to fight the gutting fire from the fast trim ships? The spirit inside you overpowered by anger? How could I be severed from you, dear boy? left behind on the beachhead here, alone. The old horseman Peleus had me escort you that day he sent you out from Phythia to Agamemnon, a, younger, a youngster still untrained for the great leveler, war, still green at the bait where men can make their mark. So he dispatched me to teach you all these things to make you a man of words and a man of action too. Cut off from you with a charge like that, dear boy? I have no heart to be left behind, not even if Zeus himself would, square, would swear to scrape away the scruff of age and make me young again, as fresh as I was that time I first set out for Hellas, where the women are a wonder fleeing a blood feud with my father, Antinor, or Mensus' son. Now Phoenix is going to start to tell a short story about his own backstory. How furious father was with me over his mistress with her dark, glistening hair. How he would dote on her and spurn his wedded wife, my own mother. And time and again she begged me, hugging my knees, to bed my father's mistress down and kill the young girl's taste for an old man. Mother, 
I did your bidding, did your work. But father, suspecting it once, cursed me round me. He screamed out to the cruel furies, never, never let me bounce on my knees, a son of his sprung of his loins. So Phoenix's father has cursed him to never have a child because he had sex with Phoenix's father's mistress. It's a lot of uh, behind to the scene at the request of his mother. So it's a screwed up family, no doubt. But this is kind of a, a, a trope or a common occurrence in a lot of Greek literature is that the past comes back to bite you if your family is screwed up. It kind of follows you along. And it follows you along uh, through the mythological character of the Furies, these uh, demigods who punish people for past inaction. That kind of recurs. It's like, okay, you're still screwing up. You're still coming around and doing the same things over and over again, so you're about to get punished again. And keep that in mind as Phoenix starts to shape his appeal. How does that idea of a curse or the thing that kind of goes around and comes around, how does that start to appeal to what Achilles is going through now? So he says again, never, never let me bounce on my knees a son of his sprung of his loins. And the gods drove him home that curse, mighty Zeus of the underworld and grim Persephone. So I... I took into my head to lay him low with sharp bronze, but a god checked my anger. He warned me of what the whole realm would say, the loose talk of the people, rough slurs of men. They must not call me a father killer, our Achaeans. So what connections does Phoenix's anecdote or his short story about his life have to Achilles' situation? Then nothing could keep me there, my blood so fired up. No more strolling about the halls with father raging, but there was a crowd of kin and cousins round me, holding me in the house, begging me to stay. They butchered plenty of fat sheep, banquet fare, and shambling crook-horned cattle, droves of pigs, succulent, rich with fat. They singled, they, sir, they singed the bristles, splaying the porkers out across a feistous fire. Then wine from the old man's jars, all we could drink. Nine nights they passed the hours hovering over me, keeping the watch by rounds. The fires never died. One ablaze in the colonnade of the walled court, one in the porch outside my bedroom doors. But then, when the tenth night came on me, black as pitch, I burst the doors of the chamber, bolted tight, and out I rushed. I leapt the walls at a bound, giving the slip to guards and women servants, and away I fled through the whole expanse of Hellas, and gaining the good dark soil of Phythia, mother of flocks, I reached the king, and Pel Peleus gave me a royal welcome. So Phoenix has escaped from his crazy family's bizarre behavior of his mother convincing him to bed his father's mistress his father cursing him to never have a child, his uh, cousins and family constantly around watching to make sure he never escapes. He feels trapped, he feels isolated, and so he breaks out and runs to Phythia, which is the home of Achilles and Achilles' father, Peleus. Peleus is the king, and he welcomes him. A royal welcome, right after line 580. Peleus loved me as a father loves a son. I tell you, his only child, the heir to his boundless wealth, he made me a rich man. He gave me throngs of subjects. I rolled the dollops, settled down on Phythia's west frontier, and I made you what you are, strong as a god, Achilles. He's back on point here. I loved you from the heart. You'd never go with another to banquet or on the town, or feast in your own halls, never until I'd sat you down on my knees. And cut you the first bits of meat, remember? You'd eat your fill. I'd hold the cup up to your lips, and all too often you soaked the shirt on my chest, 
spitting up some wine, a baby's way, a misery. Oh, I had my share of troubles for you, Achilles, did my share of labor, brooding, never forgetting the gods would bring no son of mine to birth, not from my own loins. So you, Achilles, great godlike Achilles, I made you my son. I tried so someday you might fight disaster off my back. But now, Achilles, beat down your mounting fury. It's wrong to have such an iron, ruthless heart. Even them gods themselves can bend and change, and theirs is the greater power, honor, strength. Even the gods, I say, with incense, soothing vows, with full cups poured and the deep, smoky savory, men can bring them round. Begging for pardon when one oversteps the mark, does something wrong. Okay, so what follows is one of my favorite parts in all of the Iliad. I think it's one of the most beautiful passages in all of ancient Greek antiquity. And so I'll read it and then I want to talk about it a little bit. We do have prayers, you know. Prayers for forgiveness. Daughters of mighty Zeus. And they limp and halt. They're all wrinkled, drawn. They squint to the side, can't look you in the eyes, and always bent on duty, trudging after ruin, maddening, blinding ruin. But ruin is strong and swift. She outstrips them by far, stealing a march, leaping over the whole wide earth to bring mankind grief. And the prayers trail after, trying to heal the wounds. And then, if a man reverses these daughters of Zeus and they draw near him, they will help him greatly and listen to his appeals. But if one denies them, turns them away, stiff-necked and harsh, off they go to the son of Cronos, Zeus, and pray that ruin will strike the man down, crazed and blinded until he's paid the price. So we're going to try to puzzle through what this complex set of images is talking about. And I want us to think about what happens when we turn away forgiveness and redemption for resentment and bitterness. What happens in your own life, and you can think about it for yourself, when you're faced with the option of accepting a wrong and trying to overcome it, or instead becoming resentful and bitter and hateful and spiteful of the world around you. This is a, an old, old problem. It's outlined in many famous uh, philosophical works. One of my favorite is the works of Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, who talks about resentment or this idea of resentment. That when you feel the pangs and the pains of life, you have basically two choices. You can turn to the world and say, the world is so bitter, unjust, and unfair that it would be better if it didn't exist at all. Or you can, in Phoenix's beautiful imagery, turn to the wrinkled and blind daughters of Zeus prayer. They kind of look at you and squint at the side, can't look you in the eye. They walk in, in halts. They're not as fast or as powerful as the destructive force that we may sometimes feel, that we feel is demanded of injustice, that we need to smash the systems and in, in revolution and destroy systems, destroy hierarchies in order to bring down the system and then rebuild from the, from the ground up. Right? This is the idea of resentment, resentment. Or we can pray. 
And prayer here is not the, I want a big car and, and, a, and a fancy house kind of praying. It's not wish fulfillment. It's, 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 a, it's a fundamental question of what has gone wrong here? What has broken down? What's broken down in the society as a whole, in the entire structure of what we're working with? In this case, it's the structures of Puene and Apuene and, and the honor society. But it's also what's broken down in the individual himself. What's broken down within Achilles? How has he failed? Because if you don't do that, if Achilles doesn't do that, if, if we don't do that as a society, if we allow ourselves to become bitter and dark and resentful, of all the successes and all the injustices and all the inequalities that the system produces, well, what happens? It only gets worse. Ruin still comes. Prayers are slow, but ruin is quick. It steals the march. And so with resentment, only ruin follows. But through acts of forgiveness and deep introspection, perhaps improvement may be possible. And that improvement comes from within, rather than tearing down the entire system. It's an unbelievable passage. It's deep and, and metaphorical, and I think it's, it's one of those timeless passages that makes the Iliad one of the great philosophical and, and psychological works of, of, of the Western canon. So we're here after about line 624. Relent, Achilles. You too, even you, great and godlike as you are, see that honor attend these good daughters of Zeus, honor that says, sways the minds of others even heroes. If Agamemnon were not holding out such gifts with talk of more to come, that son of Atreus, if the warlord kept on blustering in his anger, why, I'd be the last to tell you, cast your rage to the winds, defend your friends, despite their desperate straits. But now, look, he gives you a trove of treasures right away and vows there are more to follow. He sends the bravest captains to implore you. Leaders picked from the whole Achaean army, comrades in arms, that you love most yourself. Don't dismiss their appeal, their expedition here, though no one could blame your anger, not before. So it was in the old days, too. So we've heard in the famous deeds of fighting men, of heroes, when seething anger would overcome the great ones, still you could bring them round with gifts and winning words. There's an old tale I remember, an ancient exploit. Nothing recent, but this is how it went. We are all friends here. Let me tell it to you now. So what follows is Phoenix's parable of Meliager. So a parable, and we'll talk about this here, is a simple story used to illustrate a moral lesson. Previously, when we looked at Plato's Republic and specifically the allegory of the cave, we talked about an allegory. An allegory is, in, in a lot of ways, a slightly more complex parable. Remember, we talked about it as being a building in which each level is populated by different symbols or people doing a different kind of work. And if we looked at the building as a whole, we would kind of get this, this narrative that gives many different lessons about how we may live our lives, right? Or many different outputs that the building could produce. You know, maybe one floor is a cafeteria, and maybe one floor is uh, a business planning uh, series of seminars, and, and maybe one floor is, a, is an architecture company, and then maybe one floor is a dentist. All of these different things are working in concert with each other all the way up to create the overall structure of the building. A parable is a lot more straightforward. 
A parable is meant to simply connect two uh, stories or two individuals like a bridge connects two islands. So that's how I kind of think about um, a parable versus um, an allegory. An allegory is like a building, a parable is like a bridge. We're gonna he try here to connect Achilles with what the parable is going to talk about is this, this character of Meliager. And this picture here is a picture of Meliager engaged in a famous boar hunt. Meliager, like Achilles, is a great warrior, loved by his people, but extremely hot-headed, very rash, and quick to anger. So we're going to read, when we get back, the parable of Meliager, and we're going to try to define the simple lesson that Phoenix is trying to outline here to Achilles. Okay, let's pick up where we left off. We were just getting in to Phoenix's parable of Meliager. Meliager was this great warrior who shares many of the same similarities to Achilles. Keep in mind then that this is going to act as a parable, as a short story that's meant to illustrate a singular kind of lesson or idea. We're at about line 645, and it starts out, the Croatis were fighting the combat-hardened Aetolians, armies ringing Caledon, slaughtering each other, Aetolians defending their city's handsome walls, and Croatis primed to lay them to waste in battle. So think about the relationship there. We've got the Greeks and the Trojans. We have the Aetolians and the Croatis. One's defending cities, one's attacking cities. It all began when Artemis, throned in gold, loosed a disaster on them, and sensed that Oenius offered her no first fruit, his orchard's crowning glory. Artemis is the sister, the younger sister of Apollo. Remember, Apollo is the uh, archer god of the sun, you know, music. Artemis is his sister. Now, if he's the god of the sun, that would make Artemis the goddess of the moon. She is the goddess also of the hunt, of, um, of wildness, of, uh, uh, of youthful femininity of kind of that wild, youthful femininity, um, and of, of nature. So she is incensed at, or incredibly angry at this character, Oenius, and that he didn't give her a sacrifice. Gods are often angry about not getting what they think is rightfully theirs, and usually it comes in the form of a sacrifice. The rest of the gods had feasted full on oxen, true, but the huntress alone, this is Artemis again, the huntress, alone, almighty Zeus's daughter, Oenius gave her nothing. It slipped his mind or he failed to care, but what a fatal error. How she fumed Zeus's child who showers arrows, she's also an archer. She loosed a bristling wild boar, his tusks gleaming, crashing his savage, monstrous way through Oenius's orchard, ripping up whole trunks from the earth to pitch them headlong, rows of them, roots and all, apple blossoms and all. So the, the goddess Artemis unleashes this wild boar, this giant boar that's powerful enough to knock down trees and destroy whole vineyards. So it's an extremely deadly, dangerous animal that's costing this kingdom a lot of money. So it's got to be killed. It's a problem that needs to be solved. But the son of Oenius, Meliager, cut him down. Okay, so there's our champion. He's the one that solves the problem. Mustering hunters out of a dozen cities. Packs of hounds as well. No slim band of men could ever finish him off. 
that ripping killer. He stacked so many t uh, men atop the tear-soaked pyre, but over his body the goddess raised a terrific den. Now this is where the real curse comes in. It's not just the boar, but we might think of it as like the spirit of the boar. So the boar has been claimed, uh, has been killed, but it took all these men to do it. And now a war for the prize, the head of the huge beasts uh, and, and, and its shaggy hide, Kuretes locked to the death with the brave Aetolians. So at one point, the two cities were allies. They got together and they killed this boar. And now the real disaster emerges as they're fighting for the prize, the boar's head. Now, so long as battle-hungry Meleager fought, so this is the war now between the Curetes and the Aetolians, and Meleager belongs to the um, Aetolians. Um, they're fighting over the, the, the boar's body, remember. It was deadly going for the Curetes, no hope of holding their ground outside their own city walls, despite superior numbers. But then, when the wrath came sweeping over the man, this is Meleager, the same anger that swells the chests of others. Hmm, I wonder who he's talking about here, Phoenix. Who, what others swell with anger? For all their care and self-control, then, heart enraged at his own dear money, mother, Althea, Meleager kept to his bed beside his wedded wife, Cleopatra, that great beauty, remember her? The daughter of trim-heeled Marpesa, Aeneas' child, and her husband, Idas, strongest man of men who once walked the earth. He even braved Apollo. He drew his bow at the archer, all for Malpesa, the girl with lovely ankles. There in the halls, his father, her father and mother always called Cleopatra ha Halcyon, after the seabird's name. Grieving once for her own fate, her mother had raised the healthy Halcyon's thin, painful cry, wailing that Lord Apollo, the distant, deadly archer, had whisked her far from Itis. This is a long backstory. Meliager's Cleopatra, she was the one he lay beside those days, brooding over his heartbreaking anger. He was enraged by the curses of his mother. Volleys of curses she called down from the gods. So racked with grief for her brother he had killed, she had kept pounding her fists on the earth that beats us all, but kept crying out to the god of death and grim Persephone, flung herself on the ground, tears streaking her robes, and she screamed out, Kill Meliager, kill my son. Okay, so Meliager had to kill his brother. And now he's being cursed by his mother. And because he's being cursed by his mother, he refuses to fight. Okay, so he's sitting by his bedside. He's furious. He's mad. He's angry. And out of the word of darkness, a fury heard her cries. <clears throat> stalking the night with a fury's brutal heart and suddenly thunder breaking around the gates, the roar of enemies, towerings, towers battered under assault, and Aetolia's elders begged Meliager, sent high priests of the gods, pleading, come out now, defend your people now. And they vowed a princely gift. Wherever the richest lands of green Caledon lay, there they urged him to choose a grand estate, full fifty acres, half of it turned to vineyards, half to open plowland, and carve it from the plain. And over and over the old horseman Oenios begged him. He took a stand at the vaulted chamber's threshold, shaking the bolted doors and begging his son. Over and over his brothers and noble mother implored him. He refused them all the more, and troops of comrades, devoted, dearest friends. Not even they could bring his fighting spirit round, until at last rocks were raining down on the chamber, Creates about to mount the towers and torch the great city. And then 
finally, Meleager's bride, beautiful Cleopatra, begged him, streaming tears, recounting all the griefs that fall to people whose cities seized and plundered, the men slaughtered, citadel burned to rubble, and en enemies dragging the children, raping the sashed and lovely wo women. His spirit leapt when he heard those horrors, and buckling his gleaming armor round his body, out he rushed to war, and so he saved them all from the fatal day. He gave way to his own feelings, but too late. And here is the moral of Phoenix's parable. No longer would they make good the gifts, those troves of gifts to warm his heart. And even so, he beat off that disaster empty-handed. So take a step back now. Remember that this is Phoenix telling us a parable about Meliager. What is he trying to convince Achilles of? How is his strategy working to persuade Achilles to come back? But you, this is on line 730, but you, you wipe such thoughts from your mind. Don't let your spirit turn you down that path, dear boy. Harder to save the warships once they're up in flames. Now, while the gifts still wait, go out and fight. Go. The Achaeans all will honor you like a god. But enter this man-killing war without the gifts? Your fame will flag. No longer the same honor, even though you hurl the Trojans home. Now, finally, Achilles will respond to Phoenix. But the swift runner Achilles answered firmly, Phoenix, old father, bred and loved by the gods, what do I need with such honor as that? I say my honor lies in the great decree of Zeus. That gift will hold me here by the beat ships as long as the life breath remains inside my chest and my springing knees will lift me. Another thing, take it to heart. I urge you, stop confusing my fixed resolve with this, this weeping and wailing just to serve his pleasure, Atreus's mighty son, this is Agamemnon. It degrades you to curry favor with that man, and I will hate you for it. I who love you. It does you proud to stand by me, my friend, to attack the man who attacks me. By be king on a par with me, take half my honors. These men will carry their message back, but you? You stay here and spend the night in a soft bed. Then, tomorrow, at first light, we will decide whether we sail home or hold out here. Aha! Take a second. How has Achilles' decision to stay and fight or leave changed as a result of what Phoenix has said to him so far? From Odysseus to Phoenix, has Achilles changed? In what way? Think about that. With that, he gave Patroclus a sharp glance, a quiet nod, to pile the bedding deep for Phoenix now, a sign to the rest to think of leaving quickly. Giant Ajax rose to his feet, the son of Telamon, tall as a god, turned and broke his silence. Now, Ajax my man. Ready, Odysseus, royal son of Laertes, great tactician. Come, home we go now. There is no achieving our mission here, I see. Not with this approach. Best to return at once. Give the Achaeans a full report, defeating as it is. They must be sitting there waiting for us now. Achilles. 
He's made his own proud spirit so wild in his chest, so savage, not a thought for his comrade's love. We honored him past all others by the ships. Hard, ruthless man. Why any man will accept the blood price paid for a brother murder, a child done to death, and the murderer lives on in his own country. The man has paid enough, and the injured kinsman curbs his pride, his smoldering vengeful spirit, once he takes the price. You. The gods have planted a cruel, relentless fury in your chest. All for a girl, just one. And here we offer you seven outstanding beauties. That and a treasure trove beside. Achilles, put some human kindness in your heart. Show respect for your own house. Here we are, under your roof, sent from the whole Achaean force, past all other men, all other Achaean comrades. We long to be your closest, dearest friends. That voice takes a lot out of me. <clears throat> tall as a god, right? You gotta be tall as a god. So think here. I, I'd like you to try to describe two ways, and if you can do more, better, that Ajax's appeal is different from the other two. Because that's it. That's the appeal. And the swift runner Achilles answered warmly, Ajax, royal son of Telamon, captain of armies, all well said, after my own heart, or mostly so. But my heart still heaves with rage whenever I call to mind that arrogance of his, how he mortified me right in front of the Argives, that son of Atreus, treating me like some vagabond, like some outcast stripped of all my rights. You go back to him and declare my message. I will not think of arming for bloody war again, not till the son of wise King Priam, dazzling Hector, batters all the way to the Myrmidon ships and shelters, slaughtering Argives, gutting the holes with fire. But round my own black ship and camp, this Hector blazing for battle will be stopped, I trust, stopped dead in his tracks. So how has Achilles' decision, decision changed once again? Odysseus, then Phoenix, and finally Ajax, how has Achilles changed throughout these different appeals to him? And think about why. So he finished. Then each man, lifting his two-handed cup, poured out to the gods, and back they went along the ships, Odysseus and the lead. And so concludes that section of Book 9 of the Iliad. As you move to the questions for analysis, think about the success of the embassy. Was the embassy successful? Why or why not? Whose appeal is the most successful? Odysseus's, Phoenix's, or Ajax's? Think about why. And whose appeal is the least successful? And again, why? I'm looking forward to hearing your answers. Thank you so much for your attention. Have a great day. Bye-bye.